All right. Well, guys, uh, first off, good morning. Happy to be back. My name is Curtis, if you don't know me, associate pastor at uh, Mercy Fellowship Church, and uh, honored to be back. And uh, yeah, honored to be here and preaching to you guys again. I wanted to highlight just one more time, Ryan Michaela. They're getting married. We should applaud that. That is phenomenal. Yeah. Ryan Michaela getting married. Womp womp. No. Congrats, guys. Happy for you. And uh, church, you're phenomenal. Uh, when I chat with you guys, uh, even after our little time, and even before uh, service began, you're an encouraging church. Um, you're, you're a good church to be around. And uh, you guys have life with things like marriages taking place in your midst. And so praise God for that. Um, God's at work in your midst. And that's worth celebrating. If you've got a Bible, Romans chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. And uh, let me just go ahead and start off with, uh, with priming the pump by saying this. It's easy to take shots at the American church, the Western church. Uh, Western church does a lot of things that are, that are good and right, but the church also does a lot of things that are, that are not good, I believe. And one of the things I believe that the church does not do well in the West is this. We have made a distinction between sacred and secular. And uh, this takes place, church, uh, throughout all of our communities. And what happens is this. We go ahead and make these distinctions of things that are Christian and non-Christian. You, you tracking with me on this? We have Christian and non-Christian music. We have Christian and non-Christian movies. We have Christian and non-Christian counselors. We have Christian and non-Christian nations. Uh, in fact, there was a, a, a rapper by the name of Lecrae. I don't know if any of you guys know who this is. He's a Christian guy. Before he was a Christian, he was in Texas and driving around with one of his friends in the street. They're listening to some music that had some foul language in it. And when they, got, when they were driving past a church, his friend turned the volume down on the radio. And he said, hey, what are you doing? He said, bro, it's a church. Have some respect. And right, that's the idea, right? The church is a, a sacred place. And then, okay, maybe the curb is 50-50 sacred secular. And then the street, well, well that's secular, right? And we make these distinctions of Christian versus non-Christian, sacred versus secular. And my big problem with all this church is this. The early church fathers and the apostles never thought this way. There might be some good that comes out of labeling things Christian versus non-Christian. But you don't see that in the Bible. You don't see this with the apostles or the early church fathers. Matthew 28, before Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father, he says... All authority on heaven on, and on earth has been given to me. And what does that mean? It means it all belongs to God. It's all his. And the result of this church from the apostles was this. The, the apostles and the early church fathers, many of them were murdered and martyred because of this. You, that's why you have people believe the apostle Paul was beheaded. That's why you have Peter, people believe he was hung on a cross upside down. Because it wasn't worthy to be hung on a cross like his savior Jesus. That's why the apostle John, he was boiled in a pot of oil and then abandoned to the island of Patmos to die. They could not say, Jesus is Lord of my heart, but Caesar's Lord of the nation. No, no, they were too convinced, too convicted too compelled to make this distinction between sacred versus secular. It all belonged to God. It's all His. And the result of that church was twofold. One, they were ferocious in their evangelism and telling people about who Jesus was and what He had done for their lives. And two, the proclamation that Jesus was Lord. He's Lord over everything. And so what happened because of this? The result of this was that nations were changed. And I would say nations were changed for the better, right? 2,000 years later, we're in Burlington, Washington, worshiping Jesus. That's crazy. We came to the ends of the earth. What happens is that nations were changed for the better. Okay, but let's break that down a little bit. How do nations change? Nations change when individuals' hearts are changed. And how are individuals' hearts changed? Well, they're changed when they're made righteous. And how are people made righteous? That's a great question. It's what we're going to be talking about today. So the definition of righteousness, church, if you've grown up in church, you've heard the definition of righteousness is that you are right before God. And that's true. That's right. That's good. That's a correct definition. Another definition of righteousness, though, that I think that will help us today is this conformity to a certain set of expectations. 
Righteousness is conforming to a certain set of expectations. Now, church, if that's true, we all long for righteousness. We all want to belong. We all want to be on the in crowd. We all want to have a place where we can belong. So like I said, Romans chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. Here's the context for Romans, though. Paul, he's writing to the church in Rome, and it's a mixture of both Jews and Gentiles in this church, and they're struggling with unity, something that you guys aren't struggling with, and so praise God for that. They're struggling with unity, though, and Paul's intention is to try to unite the church. And the Jews, they know the Old Testament. They know it better than the Gentiles in Rome who are now part of the church. And so what they're doing is this. Well, hey, if you're going to be a a true Christian, quote unquote, then it's Jesus plus being kosher. If you're going to be a true Christian, then it's Jesus plus you being circumcised. Uh, It's always this, this, uh, this equation that happens not only in the church of Rome, but it all happens throughout all generations, where it's Jesus plus something equals righteousness. That's what's taking place in their church. So Paul, wanting to unite this church, he starts off with Romans chapter 1 saying this, All nations are under the wrath of God. How's that for unity? All nations are under the wrath of God, and they're under the wrath of God because they are suppressing the truth about God. Claiming to be wise, they became fools as they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the glory of little idols made of wood. All nations are under the wrath of God. And so the Israelites, the the Jews, they would have heard this in the church. And as this letter is being read, they'd say, hey, you preach it, Paul. You tell them how wicked they are. Good thing we're the remnant. Good thing we're chosen. Good thing we have the law. And the Apostle Paul would say this in chapter 2. He says, hey, not so quick, Jews. You who have the law and tell others not to commit adultery. Don't you commit adultery? You who tell others not to steal, don't you steal? And he says in chapter 2, he says, You who boast in the law, you dishonor God by breaking the law. And because of your hard and impenitent hearts, you are storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of judgment. What's Paul doing here? Paul's plan for unity in this church is that he's giving them a fair playing field. It's not just the Jews who are condemned, but as the Gentiles as well. It's not just the lawless who are condemned before God, but it's also the law-abiding citizen who thinks by his legalism and performance he can be made right with God. He thinks that he can be made righteous. So that's where we start, church. That's the context. Romans chapter 3, verses 9. We'll stop at verse 18. The Apostle Paul, he says this. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. That's chapter 1 and chapter 2. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, and they use their tongues to deceive The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Uh, This is a selection. If you're looking on the screen, it's kind of hard to tell. But in your Bibles, it's kind of indented this section. And it lets you know that these are a selection of of verses from the Old Testament. Most likely, most of of them are from, from the Psalms. And what's happening here? Well, in a humorous way, some scholars think that the Apostle Paul is taking words that rabbis would have put together to use against the Gentiles. And the Apostle Paul is using these and he's using it against them. Hey, this is what your own people think about you and say about you. You're not as great as you think you are. Now, that's a possibility. We don't know that for certain. What we do know for certain, though, church, is this. These verses are the cherry on top to Paul's, Paul's global condemnation of people because of their sin. Did you notice the repetition of these words of, of no one and all, right? Verse 10, none is righteous. No, not one. Verse 11, no one understands. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. No one does good, not even 
one. Right? We already said this. He's not just condemning the Gentiles. He's also condemning the Jews. And I think it's worth asking this church. Like, if his, if his aim is to unite the church, why is he going this route? Right? Why is he going this way? I think if the Apostle Paul was here talking to us, he would tell us this. Hey, I want to let you guys know, you're, you as followers of Jesus, you're not better than anyone else. You're not better than anyone else. And we often do this as followers of Jesus, don't we? We often have this compare game just to, to try to check to make sure we're doing good in life. I'm going to look at this person. I'm going to, I'm going to gauge myself by this person. I'm going to see, okay, I'm doing a little better. Maybe my, my bank account's a little bigger than theirs. Maybe my life's a little more put together than theirs. And we do this why. Well, the Bible, it works its way from, down to our hearts we're trying to justify ourselves. We're trying to make ourselves righteous is what we're trying to do. This is what the Jews did. How so? Well, for the Jews, it was about conforming to their standards in order to be right. You needed to act as a Jew in order to be right, in order to be in that in crowd, quote, in the church. And, and the reality for us, church, is this. We do this in the church to this day. Let me say this. Martin Luther said, every week the gospel has to be proclaimed because every week we're in, we're in, we're in, um, we're in fear of forgetting the gospel. Something to that effect. And that's right. Because if, if we don't remember the gospel, what's going to happen is that we fall into these traps where in order for you to be a, quote, true Christian, it's Jesus plus something makes you righteous. And we do this in the church. We do this in the church. Okay, if, if you're going to be a true Christian in the church and you're single, well, you should probably be married. And, and if you're going to be a true Christian in the church, then if you're married, you should probably have kids. And if, and if you're a true Christian in the church and you have kids, they should probably be homeschooled. And, and the list goes on and on and on. All good things, all things of which might glorify God, but nothing, church, that makes you right before God. Nothing that makes you right before God. These are all good things, but if these get added to what make us right before God, it's not only going to be harmful, it's going to lead to suffering in the body. Inevitably, for some people, it leads to damnation. We do not add to the gospel. We dare not add to our righteousness. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, and we ought to believe that. It's not conservative versus liberal. It's not black versus white. It's not rich versus poor. All stand condemned before God because of sin. And I want you to think about it in this category of looking horizontally versus looking vertically. Horizontally, if I compare myself with other people, I might, I might be filled up with pride. But if I look vertically to God, hopefully there has a sense of awe and a sense of humility that comes over me. Here's how I describe it, okay? Okay. Let's go ahead and say uh, vertically, not vertically, horizontally, man-to-man, -man, I'm having a jump contest against a, a Seattle Seahawk. You guys know who DK Metcalf is? Some of you know who that is? All right, he just got in trouble, for do and he's got a drug test coming his way because there was a video of him jumping to catch a ball, and he jumped too high, apparently. Okay? Say me and DK Metcalf had a jump contest, okay? Man-to-man, -man, horizontally, who's going to jump higher? Well, he's going to jump higher than me, obviously. I can only jump about a foot high. Obviously, he's going to win. Okay, let's aim at something bigger than ourselves, greater than ourselves. First one to jump to the moon wins. We're not, it doesn't matter that he can jump a few feet taller than me. That's an impossible thing that none of us are going to win. I think of R.C. Sproul, the great theologian, and he used this same analogy. And he said, okay, in Christianity, horizontally, let's go ahead and choose the best we have in Christianity other than Jesus. Who is it? Okay, well, let's go ahead and choose the Apostle Paul, right? The Apostle Paul, he's a good guy. We're reading his letter right now. Okay, who's the worst person in human history that we can think of? Probably Hitler, right? Probably Hitler. You know a conversation goes south when Hitler gets brought up. Okay, man to man, horizontally, who's better? Obviously the Apostle Paul. Like if I'm choosing bunk bed partners for a week at camp, I'm choosing the Apostle Paul, okay? I trust him a little more than I do Hitler. Vertically, before God, who's right? Both fall short. Both are in need of grace. 
Both are in need of forgiveness. Both need Christ's righteousness. You see how this works? You see how Paul bringing out this condemnation, bringing out this sin, it makes a, a fair playing field where it doesn't really matter if you're a little more moral than me, although I hope that you are moral. It doesn't really matter so much so that you're trying to work your way to Jesus. No, no, no. No, no, it's only by faith in Jesus. We have this fair playing field where it's only by faith in Jesus that we can be made right with him. I think if the Apostle Paul was here in our midst, he would tell you and me, hey, you're not better than anyone else. Continuing on, verses 19 through 20. The Apostle Paul, he says this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes a knowledge of sin. In these verses here, there's this language that is judicial that's taking place. And, and Paul's painting a picture for you and for me of a courtroom where God is the judge, and God is the judge to whom we have to give an account of our lives. Uh, this is what's taking place. Paul says everyone who is going to go there, and if they are under the law, their mouths will be stopped. Literally in the Greek, it means apology-less. They're not going to have anything to say. The whole world will be held accountable. And this is where the Apostle Paul, he invites you and me into this picture. And it's, it's a good place for you and me to picture ourselves going before God in this courtroom, giving an account for our lives. And what are you going to say? How, how you respond to that tells, uh, is very telling for how well you understand the gospel. In that courtroom, church, before God that we will all give an account to one day, are you going to tell God of all the good things you did and all the bad things you tried to avoid? Is that where you're going to go? That reminds me of Matthew 7. Jesus, at the end of his Sermon on the Mount, people are going to say in that last day, Jesus says, Jesus, I, I cast out demons in your name. But Jesus, I did great things and, and mighty things in your name. And he says, I, I never knew you. Depart from me. We can't come to God on our last day and say, God, look at the great things I did. Look at how moral I was. Look at all the badges I have in this life. Look at how fantastic I was. No. What hope is there, church, for us from this case that Paul's making? Because Paul's saying this about you and me. We're sinful. We're unrighteous. And we've got to stand before a holy God someday. What hope do we have? On our own, church, we're hopeless. On our own, we can't make this. On our own, we are not enough. And it is at this place that the Apostle Paul, after cutting us down and cutting us down and cutting us down, that he gives us some good news. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 25. He says this, But now, all right, tone changes, But now, the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets, they bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Uh, the question, church, that we've been wrestling with, how people can be made righteous before God, because this is the only way that the heart of man changes. And this is the only way the heart of man changes. This is the only way that the nations change, and they change for the better. How can we be made right before God? Paul's efforts for unity in this church is to remind them all, hey, you're in sin. You can't do it on your own. But the good news is this, that you can be made righteous, not because of obeying the law, but because of faith in Jesus. Now, church, do you understand how freeing this is to the human soul? The freedom to receive by faith. You don't have to work for this. There's literally people that will go to Rome as Catholics and they will walk the, these steps that are said to be the steps that Jesus walked up when he was on his way to crucifixion. And they walk it on their knees as an effort to be made right with God. 
Martin Luther, he did this back in the 1500s. Uh, he's the father of our uh, Protestants. And he walked those steps and he got to the top and he says, does any of this change anything? People do this. People are working and they're striving to be made right with God. And Paul is telling you and me, no, how you're made right with God is by faith, by looking at him. It's not Jesus plus something equals your righteousness. It is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's how you're made right with God. You're made right with God by faith, by taking the eyes of faith and looking at Jesus and saying, Jesus has paid it all and all to him I owe. That he's the one, he's enough. You don't need a degree to have eyes to look by faith. You don't need to work hard to have eyes by faith. You just need to look to him by faith. And you can see that it's enough. The big pet peeve of mine, church, is uh, when people quote Romans 3.23 and they don't continue on. Uh, I already used the sound, Debbie Downer. Womp, womp, but that's what it is. Romans 3.23, people will quote that to you to tell you how sinful you are. Oh, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Womp, womp. It's not what the Apostle Paul does. The Apostle Paul, if you read it, he says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, comma, and are justified by His grace as a gift. You are made right with God by faith. So guess what, church? Here's your reality. If you're in Christ, if you're in Christ in this room, you sin daily. You fall short daily. And yet you have been completely pardoned and justified before God. That as you go into that courtroom one day to give an account, you will stand completely pardoned because of what Jesus has done for you on your behalf. Amen? Amen. Praise be to God for it. All of your sin, your failures, your brokenness, the mess, it has been given to Jesus. And all of Jesus' perfection and work has been given to you to where Paul says you've been redeemed. It literally means you've been bought out of slavery to where now you are a free person. Church, this is good news. This is great news. But let's be honest for a second, okay? You've been justified. You've been made righteous because of Christ's righteousness. So what? So what? How does this apply to your life? How does this change you at all? I want to spend the last half of this sermon talking about the outworkings of being made righteous. And here's why. I was at a seminar years ago with a pastor, and he talked about the difference between gospel proclamation and gospel culture. And here's what he's saying. Gospel proclamation, okay, we preach the gospel, all right. But also the culture of your church here and the culture of your communities, that also preaches a message as well. And he put up a picture, and it's probably from the 40s or the 50s on the wall, and it was a picture, black and white, and the banner above the church uh, stage said, Jesus saves. All right, gospel proclamation, Thumbs up. Jesus does save. That's a good one. On the stage was a bunch of Ku Klux Klan members. Gospel proclamation, Jesus saves. Gospel culture, oh, Jesus only saves white people. Jesus only thinks more highly of white people. That's sinful. Read Ephesians 2 if you care about it. So, outworkings of being made righteous. What does this look like? Well, I've got three points for you guys. Number one. You've been saved by grace. This is what the Apostle Paul says in verse 24, that it's been by a free gift of grace. A few other verses for you guys to consider. Ezekiel chapter 36, Jesus speaking to the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. He says, Ezekiel, I'm going to take your heart of stone and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. Not only that, I'm going to go ahead and place my spirit within you. What's he doing? He's making a new person, a new creation. Paul says the exact same thing later on in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So what does this mean, church, that by your faith in Jesus, you are now a new identity, a new person in Christ? It means you didn't earn any of it. It means it's all of grace. Like, I want you to have this picture. It's not mine. It's something I learned from John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. But he talks about how everyone's kind of in a pit, a deep pit of which you can't dig yourself out of. And then what Jesus does is Jesus comes along and he takes you out of that pit by grace. And he dusts you off and he gives you a new life and a new identity. And what a sinful thing, church, for you to go back to that pit, look down, and start yelling at people to get their acts together. 
clean yourself up. What's wrong with you? You're not working hard enough. Come on, get your act together. It's not what Christ did for you, church. It's not what Christ did for you. You didn't earn any of it. It is all of grace. And then the posture, therefore, church, for you towards others, it should be the same posture that Jesus had towards you, which is love, which is grace, which is compassion, which is long-suffering. Um, go ahead and share this story. Uh, a few years ago, my wife and I we went to a, a wedding in Washougal, Washington. It's on the uh, Columbia River. And then uh, the following day, we were over in Portland for a day uh, in vacation. And uh, it was a muggy day. I had an ulcer, so I was really irritable. And my wife was long-suffering with me. And uh, so it was, a, it was a rough day. And then we're in the city, though, we're going around. And uh, we go to a, a, um, a market, and there's a homeless guy there. And he catches me. Like, he's like, he runs up to me. And he wants me to buy him a gallon of milk. It's a hot summer day. I'm already upset. And he wants me to buy him a gallon of milk? Like food, maybe? Water, maybe? But a gallon of milk. And I'm upset. So I walk back into the store, though, and I say, yes, I'll do it. And, so, and he's falling behind me. He's breathing down my neck. So I'm really upset at this point. I'm really irritated. Anyways, I buy him a gallon of milk. I go back outside. And I, I usually pray for homeless people uh, when I get an opportunity to. And so I pray for him. If I'm being honest, church, it was a really gross prayer. It was a prayer I regret. It was more so a prayer of like, hey, I hope you're listening to what I'm saying. Like, I hope you follow what I, the words I'm saying. So I prayed and I said, God, I pray you uh, get this man out of homelessness. I pray you help him get his act together. Uh, it was stuff like that. And usually when I pray for homeless people, I'll go ahead and say amen. And then they walk the other way. So I prayed for this guy, I said amen, and then he went ahead and started praying. And he said, God, I thank you for saving a sinner like me and dying on the cross for me. Amen. And then he goes and he walks away. I didn't really think about it at that point, but as the, as the time went on later that day, I, I felt gutted by it. This man, this homeless man, understood the grace of God far better than I did. Because what did I do? Well, if you're going to be a, a, quote, true Christian, it's Jesus plus you not being homeless. It's Jesus plus you not mooching. It's Jesus plus you not getting in my way. And he understood, I don't deserve any of this. It is all of grace. Jesus, he had a parable to this very same thought in Luke 18, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And he said, this is a parable for those who trust in themselves that they're righteous and treat others with contempt. It's exactly what I did. And these two men, they go and they, they go to the temple to pray. And the, tax, the Pharisee, he goes and he says, God, I thank you I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I, I'm not greedy like tax collectors. I tithe. I work hard. I do my job. The tax collector, hearing this at a distance, didn't even lift his head, but beat his chest. And he said, Father, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, that tax collector went back to his house justified rather than the other. For the one who humbles himself will be exalted, but the one who exalts himself will be, in fact, humbled. Church, you've been saved by grace. It's all a gift. You didn't earn it. And the result of that, then, church, is that you are to treat others with grace and love and compassion. Number one, you've been saved by grace. Number two, you have freedom to be a sinner and kill a sin. And kill sin. Let's break this down. Number one, uh, the first out of that, too. You have freedom to be a sinner. Let's talk about what I don't mean, okay? Feel the hairs all raised. What's he talking about? Let's talk about what I don't mean. I don't mean you can sin freely. You have freedom to be a sinner. You don't have freedom to sin. Sin is a serious thing, church. Sin is the thing that separates us from God. Sin is the thing that separates us from relationships. Sin is the thing that brings suffering and pain and hardships in this world. I don't make light of sin. That's not what I'm doing. However, what I am saying is this. You don't have to pretend to have your life together, okay? You can show your sin. Now, I don't know about your church. You guys are probably all outstanding citizens. Uh, the church that I come from, though, we're a messy church. We're a messy church. At our church, we have people who have DUIs. At our church, we have people who struggle with addiction. At our church, we have people who have struggled with porn and failed marriages. And all of that church has been placed upon the shoulders of Jesus, and hopefully, by God's grace, our church is a place where the love of God is not only expressed amongst the congregation, but it's felt. This is a place where sinners can be. 
Valley community, a question for you. Is this a church where sinners are allowed to be, or do they need to pretend that they have it all together when they come in? Is this a grace-based church, or is this a Jesus plus works church? I have a long quote from a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian who died during World War II. Um, I I apologize it's not on the board because I wish that you could follow along, but I'll just highlight little parts here and there that I want you to pay attention to. He says this, The most experienced psychologist or observer of human nature knows infinitely less of the human heart than the simplest Christian who lives beneath the cross of Jesus. The greatest psychological insight, ability, and experience cannot grasp this one thing. What sin is. The worldly wisdom knows what distress and weakness and failures are, but it does not know the godlessness of man. So it also does not know that man is destroyed only by his sin and can be healed only by forgiveness. Only the Christian knows this. Listen, church. In the presence of a psychiatrist, I can only be a sick man. In the presence of a Christian brother, I can dare be a sinner. The psychiatrist must first search my heart, yet he never plumbs its ultimate depth. The Christian brother knows that when I come to him, here is a sinner like myself, a godless man who wants to confess and yearns for God's forgiveness. The psychiatrist views me as if there was no God. The brother views me as if I am before the judging and merciful God in the cross of Jesus Christ. Hopefully what happens, church, is when you're in a community, when you're in church, when you have people over and they start divulging of their sins and the hardships and the pain they're going through in life, hopefully you hear that and you say, man, this person's so messed up. They're just like me. They're just like me. Do you remember, church, Jesus had a nickname in the New Testament. It's one the Pharisees gave him to kind of mock him. And the nickname that we've all in the, in the church have come to love throughout centuries is that Jesus was the friend of sinners. He's your friend. He's my friend. He's the friend of sinners. Number one, you have the freedom to be a sinner. Number two, though, you have the freedom to kill your sin. Okay? You have the freedom to kill your sin. How is this possible? Okay, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, the result is this. You die to yourself. You die to your sinful desires. The Apostle Paul, he says in Galatians 2.20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's now Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, right? Eyes are fixed on Jesus. I have faith in him who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul, he reminds us of the gospel, gospel proclamation. What is it? Jesus Christ loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, what's, what's the culture then that flows from that? When Jesus died, I died. The old sinful habits, the sinful nature, they have died. There's a story of a a church father, Augustine. Uh, He was around 400 AD. And uh, he he was a hedonist before he was a Christian. So he was all about pleasure. That was his story. And for uh, Augustine, once he became a Christian, he was walking one of the paths that he typically walked. And and a prostitute noticed him. Said, oh, this is Augustine. I know him. I'm going to go approach him. Goes to Augustine and and tries to have a start a conversation with him. Augustine, Augustine, she says. And he doesn't pay any attention to her. He just keeps walking. And she says, Augustine, Augustine, it's I. Don't you remember? And he looks back and he says, oh yeah, it is I. No, he says, oh yeah, but it is not I. What's he saying? That old Augustine's dead. He's not the same anymore. There's now a new Augustine. What happens, church, is this. Jesus so attaches himself to us by faith where he will never leave us nor forsake us. We're attached to him for life. And the result of that then is this. You can kill your sin. And you say, well, okay, well, how is that possible though, right? We all struggle with sin. We all fall short. How do we deal with this? Well, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 talks about this. It talks about, hey, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And then it goes on to say this, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. How do we do that? How do we lay aside sin? The, the writer of Hebrews kind of talks about it almost flippantly. Yeah, just go ahead and lay it aside. How do I do this? By looking at Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Before the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised our shame. We look to Jesus, church, and as we look to Jesus, we have the freedom to kill our sin. Third point, final point we have for us about the outworkings of what it means to be made righteous. Even if your own conscience condemns you, 
God has the final say, not your feelings. Let me just say that again. Even if your own conscience condemns you, God has the final say, not your feelings. Let's look at our last few verses, Romans 3, verses 25 and 26. Paul, he says, Whom God put for us a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Paul is saying that he is our only righteousness, that is Jesus. He's our only hope of being made right with God. Our only hope for restoration in this world. And God's plan was so specific and so set in place before the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ would be the one who is not only just, but justifies. And what's he saying? God alone is the judge, not you. God alone is the one who judges. God uh, alone is the one who condemns and pardons. And praise God for that, church. God is the judge who not only pardons you, but he forgets your sins as well. He casts it so far from himself to where it is no longer in sight. This is what I believe Psalm 103 even talks about, if you, if you want a place to look at. This morning, church, a question I want to ask you is this. If God has forgotten your past, I guess the question I would ask you is this. Why haven't you? Satan will use your past against you. God won't. God's forgotten it. There's a hymn by uh, an, old, an old Welsh Presbyterian minister named Howell Harris. And he wrote this hymn and he said, Well, may the accuser roar of things that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. But my Lord, he knows none. Come on, church. Your God has forgotten your sins. So when your conscience condemns you, know this. Jesus on the cross has the final say, not your feelings. You don't get to add to your righteousness by being torn down and feeling sorrowful and feeling regretful and all these things. And I'm not even saying your emotions are bad. Don't hear me say that. I'm just saying when it comes to your relationship with God and being right before him, the work's been done. It's been done in Jesus. So let's conclude. What's God's vision for transformation? Okay? I like to think about it like this. You know, city councils, they have their visions for what a city should look like. What's God's city council vision for what the world should look like? I like to think it looks like Kirkland, Washington, but I think God has a better idea than me, so we'll go ahead and take a look at what he has to say. It's in Isaiah 61, verses 10 through 11, and he says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, this is Isaiah speaking. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, He has covered me in the robes of righteousness. This is what we're talking about right now. We've been covered in the robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. God's vision of transformation is global. Where throughout the nations, people are being clothed in righteousness. They're placing their faith in Jesus. They're being covered in God's righteousness. And the result of that is people are sprouting up throughout the nations in praise to God. And this goes back, church, to what we first talked about. How do nations change? Well, nations change when individuals' hearts are changed. And how are individuals' hearts changed? Well, they're changed when they're made righteous. And how are people made righteous? By faith in Jesus. That, church, is how the world changes. I'm not convinced that people or nations are changed by policies or picketing or protesting. I really believe it is the gospel that changes. The Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter to the church in Rome. The Apostle Paul was not outside the Colosseum protesting where other Christians were being martyred for their faith. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. No, he wasn't doing that. He had bigger fish to fry, church. He had bigger plans. He was planting churches. He was making disciples. In a few hundred years, the Colosseum was no more. Rome had collapsed, and the church was growing amongst the nations. This is your job. This is my job as followers of Jesus to speak about this righteousness. And so this morning, are you righteous? This morning, where are you trying to fit in? 
Because here's what happens. When we, what we often happens for us, church, is this. We try to fit in, but we often have to cover and hide part of who we are in order to fit into certain areas and places in society and life. But let me ask you this. What if there was a place where you could share your deepest and darkest sins and secrets and be loved more, not less, on the other side? That is our Lord Jesus. Are you righteous? If you're not righteous, I would, I, would, I would call on you to put your faith in Jesus today, to trust him. Talk to your elders. Talk to your, to your leaders among, amongst you. Talk to me afterwards. We could pray. Have you been baptized? Have you baptized, been signaling, okay, I want to make a public profession that I've died to myself and now I live a new life in Jesus Christ? If you haven't yet, I would encourage you, talk, talk, once again, talk to your elders, talk to your leaders. You can talk to me after service as well. We have been made righteous because of our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has paid it all. All to him we owe. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to gather this morning. I thank you, Father, for this gift of your righteousness that transforms hearts, that transforms nations. I pray, Father, that this reality of being made right because of Jesus would sink deep into our hearts, into our minds. It would transform our communities and how our culture is shaped here at the church, in our homes, how we treat our family and, and our spouses and our kids and our friends. That, God, we would represent you well, but also we would imitate you, Jesus, well. We would love well. We would have grace, compassion, kindness, God, we want to pray big prayers. We want to ask that you would change the nations for your glory. We want to see hearts and people come to know you. We want to see awakenings take place where the dead are rising in Christ. And new, new life is taking place, not just in this county and in this city, but across the state and across the world. God, you're so good to us. You're so good for us. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.